Welcome to Exploring the Gospels. In today's message, Meet Mark, Dr. McLuhan tells us the fascinating story of how young John Mark became passionate about making the life of Jesus known to his generation. No movement can survive without raising up the next generation of believers to carry its message. Today we meet Mark, one of the first next generation believers in Jesus. We learn how God positioned Mark to write his account of the life of Jesus. Mark was mentored by several of the apostles to carry the message of Jesus to future generations. Mark's mother, Mary, was one of a group of women who financially supported the ministry of Jesus. And you can be sure that these ladies prayed that their sons and daughters would become strong followers of Jesus and share his message with their peers. Now, there's a passage in Acts chapter 12 where we learn some important facts about Mark. Let me set the stage for this uh, exciting text before we read it so we understand just a little bit what's going on. The apostle Peter had been arrested in Jerusalem by King Agrippa. He's asleep, chained between two guards, and at least two more guards between him and the street outside of the prison. An angel awakes Peter, his chains fall off. That had to make a lot of noise. The guards didn't wake up. He's instructed to dress and to follow him, follow the angels. And so they walked out of the prison, and the doors automatically opened, and there they were in the street in front of the prison in Jerusalem. And after going down just a few blocks, the angel vanished. If you were Peter, what would you do? Yeah, well, I'd head straight to the place where the followers of Jesus were known to be gathered and praying. Now, I hate to leave this exciting rescue hanging in the air, but it's at this point that we learn several important details about Mark and his family. When Peter realized that he was not dreaming, we read this in Acts chapter 12, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, who's other name was Mark, where many were gathered together praying, Acts chapter 12 and verse 12. In this verse, we learn that the lady by the name of Mary, it was made her home available to the followers of Jesus to gather, and we learn that the mother of John, uh, Mary is mother's John, but John also goes by the name of Mark or John Mark. And as long as we're talking about Mark's family, we should also note that he was the cousin, a cousin to Barnabas, one of the famous early leaders of the New Testament church. We learn about the relationship between Mark and Barnabas from an unusual comment that Paul made writing from prison to the believers in the city of Colossae. If you turn with me to Colossians chapter 4, we read that Aristarchus my fellow prisoner greets you, and Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom you have received instruction, if he comes to you, welcome him, Colossians chapter 4 and verse 10. Now, you might be wondering, why did Mark, or how did Mark end up being with Paul while he was in prison in Rome? And to answer that, we need to go back the story up a little bit and gather more information about the details of Mark's life. After Stephen was martyred for his faith, many of the followers of Jesus moved to Antioch in Syria. And through their witness, a large number of Jewish people living in Syria turned to Jesus for salvation. As some of the followers of Jesus in Cyprus traveled to Antioch where they intentionally shared the message of Jesus with Gentiles for the first time. This is a, a shift in the way people were thinking. It was a groundbreaking development in the spread of the gospel to the ends of the earth. News of this bold decision 
reached the ears of the apostles in Jerusalem. And they asked Barnabas to go up to Antioch and check it out. Go up there and see what's going on. See if you see it's real. Barnabas was quickly convinced that these Gentiles were genuine followers of Jesus. Barnabas knew that these young people needed a good teacher. He said, I know exactly who you need. And he headed off to Tarsus in an attempt to find Saul and try to persuade Saul to come back to Antioch with him and begin this movement to lead this great new movement of people coming to know Jesus. So together, they offered weekly training to these, these uh, Gentiles who had just become followers of De Jesus and teach them how to grow. Uh, while Paul and uh, Saul, or Barnabas and Saul were in Antioch, a prophet by the name of Agabus predicted that there would be a serious famine across the region. And the church leaders in Antioch knew that the followers of Jesus in Jerusalem would soon need help buying food. They took up an offering so that their brothers and sisters in Judea could be provided for. Then Barnabas and Saul were asked to personally deliver this gift. And this is where the story of Mark's adventures with Jesus picks up again. We read, Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had completed their service of bringing and bringing with them John, whose other name is Mark. And so we, we find out that Mark has been invited to travel with Paul and, and uh, Barnabas back up to Antioch. Barnabas had such a high regard for John Mark that he wanted him to see with his own eyes what was going on in Antioch as they continued to disciple the new believers. John Mark must have been excited about this opportunity to see what God was doing in a greater way than ever happened in Jerusalem. Now, John Mark did not at all expect to become an eyewitness to the first international trip that was about to be launched from the church in Antioch. During one of their amazing gatherings, we read, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. Acts chapter 13, verse 2 and 3. Now apparently, it was more than Barnabas and Saul who were sent off from Syria to Cyprus because this is what we read. When they arrived in Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews and they had John to assist them. Acts chapter 13 and verse 5. Now while we don't know exactly what Mark did, it could have ranged all the way from physical work of handling baggage or spiritual tasks like teaching and baptizing and healing people. What we do know is that their mission went very well. We read that, we read that they went through the whole island from Salamis in the northeast corner to Paphos in the southwest tip of the island. Uh, I visited Cyprus and driven from Larnaca in the middle of the island all the way down to the bottom to Paphos. And whenever I take journeys like this, I'm always impressed with Paul's physical stamina to walk such great distances and his passion to share the message of Jesus. Now, in Paphos, Mark witnessed a phenomenal display of the power of Jesus over evil, casting out spirits. That person who had criticized them was, Paul said, would be temporarily blinded, and indeed he was, and then his blindness lifted. And all of this so impressed the governor of the island that he too became a follower of Jesus. From Paphos, Paul and Barnabas felt that they should move on to Perga in modern-day Turkey. The Bible doesn't tell us why, but when they decided to move from Perga inland to the interior cities, 
John Mark did not want to go any further on the trip. And even though John Mark loved his uncle, there was nothing that Barnabas could do to, to, to change his nephew's mind. And so Mark left the group and sailed back to Jerusalem. Paul and Barnabas went on to visit these cities. Many miracles took place. Wish I could take time to tell you about that, but that's not our purpose today. We're focusing on Mark. Eventually, they returned to Antioch and shared how God used them to lead so many people to faith in Jesus. Now, success like that often brings out jealousy in people. And some people from Jerusalem came up to Antioch and began to say to all the Gentiles, no, no, you're not saved unless you do all the things that are mentioned in the Jewish law. Uh, This just brought about a lot of heartache and confusion. The church thought we better send our leaders, Barnabas and Saul, back to Jerusalem and, and, uh, and report there directly about how God is working in the lives of Gentiles and that they should be free from Jewish law. As they spoke at that meeting, we read, all the assembly fell silent, and they listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related what signs and wonders God had done through them amongst the Gentiles, Acts chapter 15 and verse 12. Well, this report was enough for James to decide that the Gentiles did not need to follow the Jewish laws to be saved. And just as a reminder to all of us, James is the half-brother of Jesus, and by that time he had become the leader of the church in Jerusalem. John Mark, who had previously returned to Jerusalem, was an eyewitness to the report that they had just made and the decision they had just taken to not require Gentiles to follow the Jewish laws. The council appointed a man by the name of Judas and Silas to travel back with the team from Antioch and explain the official position of the church in Jerusalem to those living in Antioch. And it seemed that John Mark decided to join them and return to the city of Antioch. Perhaps he wanted to see what God was doing there. And during the time there, when they got to Antioch, the church rejoiced <laughs> that they had, uh, about the decision these leaders had made in Jerusalem. Now, before long, Paul said to himself, we've got to go again. Just can't stay here. We've got to go again. You ever got the goes feeling? Paul felt an urge to take a longer and even more ambitious trip than the first one. And when Paul began to talk to Barnabas about this idea, a hidden problem surfaced. Barnabas wanted to give John Mark the opportunity to go with them again. But Paul was definitely opposed to the idea of taking John Mark with them. Now, there have been many discussions about who was right and who was wrong. Let me take some of the tension out of this conversation by making several important observations. Although Paul and Barnabas did not see it at the time, they were too important to the kingdom of God to be on the same team. From the perspective of heaven, It was much better for two teams to be sent out than for one team to go. It really was not about John Mark. It was about the Holy Spirit seeing a better strategy for them to follow. And even though there was some pain in the split that occurred, it really was better for those two men to take two teams rather than going out as one team. Paul and Barnabas had learned enough from each other to lead their own teams and reach more people with the message of Jesus. Some healing would be necessary, and that indeed did take place. And at the end of his life, Paul wrote and said, please send John Mark to come and see me, and visit with me. I need his presence. Well, at this moment, 
Paul chose Silas and traveled uh, to the west, spreading the gospel into Europe. And Barnabas chose John Mark, returned to Cyprus. And then it appears that they went on from Cyprus south to North Africa, sharing the gospel with people there. This there is an early church tradition that says Mark became the bishop of the church in Alexandria. And he may even has traveled as far south as Ethiopia. This is what we do know, that for a period of time, Mark was mentored by the apostle Peter. In a cryptic message referring to Rome as Babylon, Peter wrote these words, she who is in Babylon, who is likely like you who was chosen, sends you greetings, and so does Mark, my son. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 13. It appears that Peter took Mark under his wing and saw in him someone who was more than a helper. I believe Peter saw more potential in Mark than either Barnabas or Paul had seen at the time. So what did Peter see in Mark? Peter saw in Mark someone who could write an account of the life and times of Jesus that would appeal to the next generation of young people coming to faith from amongst the Gentiles. I'm excited about the young people that God has brought to our church family. God loves to walk with young people. Most of the disciples of Jesus appeared to be between the ages of 15 and 30 years old. It's exciting when young people are moved by the Spirit of God. It was young people that helped us launch our media ministry. Some of us older guys didn't know what to do when COVID came around, and these young people helped us move into an area of communicating the gospel that was new and fresh. If you have an idea that you think will help our church family, my heart is open to your idea. I invite you to speak with me. Peter's heart was open to Mark. Peter understood that if Mark wrote an account of the life of Jesus that he could oversee, Mark's account would be accepted by the church. And Peter understood that the journeys Mark had taken with both Paul and Barnabas helped Mark understand the need to have a document that could be put in the hands of the next generation of young Gentile readers. It seems clear to me that Peter had the mind of the Lord in this matter. And by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Mark recalled the stories that had been told to him by his mother and by others as he interviewed them. Mark begins his gospel with these remarkable words. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Mark chapter 1 and verse 1. What a perfect introduction to young Gentiles disillusioned with Greek and Roman mythology. Mark asserts that there is one God, and we can know him because he sent his son to tell us everything we need to know about the nature of that one God. Last week, we, uh, we saw the exact point where Matthew wrote himself into the gospel. Many scholars believe that Mark wrote himself into this gospel While many believe that the Last Supper was held in the large upper room of of Mark's mother's home, Mary, many scholars believe that. Now, after the meal, Jesus took the disciples that were there uh, to the olive grove called Gethsemane, and there they began to pray. Now, tensions were extremely high in the city of Jerusalem. Everyone knew that, and John Mark felt it and must have been curious to know what was going to happen to Jesus. Consider this very odd incident that is only found in his gospel, Mark chapter 14. A young man followed him 
with nothing but linen cloth about his body. And they seized him, but he left the linen cloth and ran away naked. Mark chapter 14, verse 51 and 52. Don't you want to know more about that story? <laughs> the Greek word that Mark used for young man indicates somebody who was between the age of 25 and 40. It could be that this curious young man was none other than John Mark himself. And he has just become an eyewitness to the betrayal and the arrest of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. I believe he was there. Now, whether or not this is John Mark, there's no question that he wrote a credible account of the life of Jesus. And what he wrote was approved by the Apostle Peter and became one of the four authorized accounts of Jesus. Perhaps as you've been listening to this message, the Holy Spirit has opened your eyes to see Jesus in a new light. Over 75% of the people who listen to our messages are young men between the age of 18 and 35. This is why we don't need translation, because that is the group of people who are both hungry spiritually and who want to be able to read, understand, and speak English. That's the group that Mark had in mind when he wrote about the life of Jesus. Mark invites you to see Jesus as someone who genuinely cares for you. Jesus was very clear about his mission. Jesus identified himself with the prophecies of Ezekiel and Daniel by calling himself the Son of Man. This means that God took on the form of a human being to do for us what we could not do for ourselves. Listen to what Jesus said. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Mark chapter 10 and verse 45. Jesus came to serve. He came to help us overcome the bad habits and sins that plague us. Jesus came to help us to find purpose and meaning in life. He came to make it possible for us to have a close relationship with God. Ask Jesus to lift the weight of sin off of your back and ask him to fill you with his holy presence. Say with me, thank you, Jesus, for dying for me on the cross to pay for my sins and for inviting me to walk with you with the favor of God upon my life. If you just prayed with me to accept Jesus as your Savior or were healed, while listening to this message, write to me and tell me more about your decision to follow Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for using young John Mark as a faithful witness to your life. Thank you for the good news that he carried into Africa and that still saves lives today. Use us to carry your good news this week to your glory. Amen. We hope this message has filled you with living hope in Jesus. If you would like to talk to someone about your spiritual journey, please leave a comment or send us a private message. We enjoy reading your notes and having an opportunity to pray with you. If you received a blessing through this message, please share it with others. We invite you to become a Living Hope Partner by donating as little as a dollar a month through our QR code. Your gifts will help us create new messages and reach more people. Living Hope is a ministry of Ingleside International Incorporated. All donations for Living Hope qualify as a charitable contribution. Thank you for your prayers and support. Next week, we will continue learning together from the Word of God. God bless you and fill you with living hope.